Hi guys, today is going to be our first lesson on quantum mechanics, alright? The subject that many students look towards as fearful, and rightly so, because quantum mechanics is perhaps the only subject in physics that I can call bizarre and be justified in doing so. There's a lot of phenomena that people can't really understand, and even today, people are coming up with new explanations on what exists in the subject. Just like what the great Richard Feynman said, I believe it's safe to say that no one understands quantum mechanics. Now, unlike Newton's theory of motion and Einstein's theory of relativity, quantum mechanics came from the legends of physics and mathematicians, people like Richard Feynman, Schrodinger, Niels Bohr, uh, Paul D. Rock, Heisenberg. So, as you can see, the theory is really com comes from a sources of people and that's why it makes quantum mechanics not easy to understand. At the same time, quantum mechanics is also very broad. There's a lot of phenomena that even today, people are still looking, looking into new areas such as the, the many worlds theorem, you know, Bell's inequality, spin, you know, uh, angular momentum. So what we want to do is that we want to maintain focus on what we want to study. Now, I can't give you the whole load on what quantum mechanics is and that is not easy. But we want to focus on physical one-dimensional problems, okay? Now, you, don't, you may not know what that is, but simply put is we are looking at our systems, okay, that move in one-dimensional. So just just say, take a particle that moves on left and right. So that's what we want to study. We want to be focused on studying physical one-dimensional problems. Now, I can't give you a lowdown on the whole area of quantum mechanics, but I believe before we go into the mathematics of solving these physical problems, one needs to be equipped well enough with the theory for us to proceed. And that is what today's lesson is all about. Now, if you have the prerequisites of linear algebra and obviously maybe, you know, a few weeks of studying quantum mechanics, you should be able to sail through this video. But uh, for today, I'm going to try my best, okay? It's not easy, but I'm going to try, try my best to give an eight-minute video okay and bring those inexperienced mathematicians physicists are interested in this subject up to speed on what they need to know about quantum mechanics okay so uh, it's not easy but i'm gonna do my best all right quantum mechanics simply put is the science of the microscopic world now as you know uh, classical mechanics okay uh, newton developed his theory of motion so when we got a certain particle let's just say a car moving along the road or a book sliding on the table there are two equations that govern the motion. Okay, one is the, the equation involving the position x and the other one is the equation dealing with the momentum. And with these two equations, we can extract all we need to know about that object, which is a car or, or the book. Now, when you move into the microscopic world, and what I mean by that, well, basically microscopic is atoms, neutrons, uh, molecules. Newton's uh, laws of motion breaks down. So Newton's second law breaks down altogether. There's experimental evidence to show that there are some phenomena that happens in the microscopic world which Newton's uh, theor theories break down. And that is why we need to replace that, okay, with another thing which we call postulates. The postulates of quantum mechanics. Well, so what is this thing about postulates? Is it a theory? Is it a concept? Is it a law? Well, not quite, okay. The postulates are the minimum set of assumptions that if they are true, the quantum theory is valid. So it's the minimum set of assumptions that we build the quantum theory from. Now, can we verify them directly? Well, not quite, but there's a wide range of experiments that show that the postulates are indeed true. And not only that, if the theory works, if quantum theory works, and quantum theory works really well, you know, it just implies that the postulates are true and it also allows us to predict uh, the behavior of the phenomena. So we're just going to take a look at the postulates of this lesson to really have a grasp of the physics. Now, we can't dive into the mathematics right away, but today's going to be a mathematics-free lesson and we're going to study the postulates of quantum mechanics, all right? So remember again, Classical mechanics, Newton's laws of motion in the microscopic world, uh, the laws break down, we need to substitute that with something else. We're going to substitute that with the postulates of quantum mechanics. So, these are the postulates 1, 2, and 4. I explain why 3 is not there. It's not a mistake. Okay, postulate number 1, state of the system. The state of any physical system is specified at each time t by a state vector, okay, which is given by this thing over here. It's something very new to you, but you don't need to understand what it is. We call that a cat. Okay, actually it's irrelevant, okay, but anyways, it's a cat, it's a state vector in the Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is a type of vector space. So if you want to go deep into quantum mechanics, we need to study properties of the Hilbert space as well as all these uh, cats that exist in the Hilbert space. But the saving grace of what our focus is about is that we don't need to go into the study of the Hilbert space. Instead, the state vector can be decomposed onto an x basis. The x basis is the position basis and what we will get is that we will get a wave function in the position space, and for convenience sake, we just label it as phi. All right, so 
Now, so we got the Hilbert space, we can decompose onto the X basis. Now, the Hilbert space, we can decompose onto any other basis, but we're going to choose the X basis, which is the position basis for a reason. That is the reason is because we are dealing with physical problems that when we move, that move, well, basically it's physical problems that a particle moves forward and backwards, the position space. So all you need to know is that instead of classical mechanics where we have the, the uh, equation of the position or the equation of the momentum, in quantum mechanics, there is one function that describes that, okay, and that is the wave function. The wave function in the position space describes the... Uh, the system, okay, the physical system. All right, now the physical interpretation of this, we wait for a minute, it's down at postulate number four, so just give me a second on that. All right, postulate number two, observables and operators. To every physical measurable quantity, there corresponds an operator. Now, let's bring in some classical mechanics analogies for us to really understand what this is all about. If you got a car, right, and you got the equation of the position x, what do you do when you want to get the speed? You take the first time derivative. We all know that, right? What you want to do, they take the acceleration, we take the second time derivative. Quantum mechanics work along those principles, but what we call d dt or d2 dt2, we call it an operator. An operator that operates on the equation of the position. Just like in quantum mechanics, the physical measurable quantity that we want, we always want, is the energy. Okay, we always want the energy of the physical system. And the associated operator is the called the Hamiltonian, okay? This word you might be familiar with in classical mechanics, you know, Hamiltonian Lagrangian mechanics. We call the operator the Hamiltonian, and it's given by minus plus constant, which is a h-bar squared, divided by 2 times the mass uh, of the Laplace operator plus the potential. Okay, the Laplace operator is the second derivative of all the uh, x's, okay? So it's the d, uh, partial d, partial x2, uh, plus, and you do the same for dy. Okay, and plus for the z. So that's what the Laplace operator is. Now, let's just say the Hamiltonian, okay, is an operator. So, logically speaking, we can apply this Hamiltonian to the wave function. And that is what quantum mechanics is all about. We want a certain measurable quantity, we find an operator to apply onto the system, the state of the system, which in this case is the wave function. Now, Plax constant reduce is basically um, h divided by 2 pi, but it always comes up, so we always use h bar, okay? The Laplace operator is given by this, and this is what we call the potential. Now, just uh, skip a few steps ahead. We Remember, we want to study the microscopic world, right? The microscopic world involves atoms. Now, the atom, we can move to various potentials. And that is why, based on the, the what potential we have, we got a certain Hamiltonian. And this is what we want, the operator to apply onto the wave function. All right, so postulate number four. Uh, postulate number three is basically something that the wave function collapses onto another um, eigenstate, which you don't need to know, and that's not important for us. So we're going to throw that out, okay? Throw out what we don't need to know. Lastly, postulate number four, the probabilistic outcome of measurements. Okay, this is where the main crux of a quantum mechanics shows itself. Probability density of a measurement between x and x plus dx is given by... Okay, this is the probability density, so it's d uh, p x. We're going to take the magnitude of the wave function, square that, and multiply it by a small dx. Now, what is this telling us? Okay, now I can tell you, um, ex give you a very simple example, and then maybe you can understand. Now, in quantum, in classical physics, we see a certain car, right? And I know, I, I see the car, I know that the car is there. It's deterministic, okay? So we know for sure that a car is over there. But the thing about the microscopic world is that when we look at atoms, okay, what is the thing that for us to really measure that the atom is over there? Remember, quantum mechanics is the science of the microscopic world and we want to take measurements in the microscopic world. So how do I know an atom is there? Well, I need to measure it. But what do I need for me to measure it? I need light. I need light to shine on the atom so I know that the atom is there. But in quantum mechanics, the light, the mere fact of measuring the atom and using light to measure the atom knocks the atom out of its place. You see, that is why there's this indeterministic nature in the quantum world, in the microscopic world. So, remember, the wave function describes the state, right? So basically, we're dealing with uh, atoms in the state, particles in the state. If I want to measure, okay, the particle, I am given a probability density function. So, in classical mechanics, I know that the car is here. The car is not going to move. I know that the car is here. But in quantum mechanics, I can't say that because the particle, you know, exists um, along the position axis, okay, and whenever I measure it, there comes this probabilistic outcome. 
and that probabilistic outcome is given by this thing over here. Take the magnitude of the wave function, take that squared. So what I'm, I'm essentially doing is that I'm measuring dx, this quantity over here, okay, which is going to be integrate the probability density and dx, okay, from um, x to x plus dx. And this gives me the probability of finding the particle over there. All this boils down to what is known as the Heisenberg's principle, okay? If we want to measure something, there comes this uncertainty principle. Because in the microscopic world, we need light, and that is essentially the problem. All right, and lastly, positive number five is the showing the equation, and it's given by this over here.